Manhattan in the 1800s was a crime-infested slum and a living hell for many of its inhabitants. If anyone was to expose the seedy goings-on in this underworld to the wider public, a fearless investigative journalist was required. There was just such a man, and his name was Arthur Pember, an Englishman who ventured into New York's criminal underworld to expose crime and corruption. Working undercover for the New York Tribune, he exposed crime and prostitution in the city's panel houses, going to great lengths to uncover corruption, even to the extent of assuming disguises, such as a street beggar, to walk unnoticed in the slums around Water Street, a notorious neighborhood of crime and debauchery. In a previous video, we learned about the beginning of his journey through Water Street after dark, accompanied by a police detective, where he met some of the city's most infamous characters of the time, including Tommy Haddon, owner of dive bars and a well-known operator in shanghai and Kit Burns, a saloon keeper who ran bare-knuckle boxing prize fights, rat-baiting and dog fights. Today he continues on his dangerous investigation, and you will discover the wretched conditions he found in an underground lodging house, and the plight of the miserable people he found living there. He also meets some characters from New York's criminal underworld, and attempts to dodge an outbreak of fighting. You may ask what was a lodging house, and why were many of them so repulsive? Well, many working-class New Yorkers lived in overcrowded and dirty tenements in the 1800s, and for immigrants to the city and the poor, there was a quick and cheap alternative to renting a room. But it was one that offered even worse accommodation. Those who found themselves in the city waiting for work to turn up and fortunes to change needed an affordable bed for the night and would likely find their way to a lodging house, which charged by the night, the worst of which were commonly known as a flop house. And, depending on their luck with finding a job, they might get stranded there. Prices varied as much as standards, and the conditions of the cheapest in the city's fourth ward were simply terrible. A man might start off sleeping at a thirty-cent house, but as his means diminished, so did the conditions of the accommodation he could afford, until a bed that costs ten cents a night or less would get you dirty sheets, a nasty atmosphere, and the ready club in the watchman's hand ever threatening. In the very cheapest you would find yourself sleeping on a hammock, a simple bench or even just a corner on the floor. If, in the unlikely event the price included breakfast, then you were likely to eat a simple boiled mush, a kind of porridge, before being kicked out on the streets if you had no work to go to. You can imagine the repulsive smell of the place in winter, when demand for a bed was high and the bodies of labouring men were crammed on top of one another in rows of bunks full of bed bugs whilst between the residents roamed vermin amongst the filth. This was the appalling state of accommodation that 19th century New York had to offer the poor, into which Arthur Pember stumbles, unawares as to the horror that awaits. Before we move on, if you're interested in history like this, and you want to find out more about what life was really like for people in the past, please consider subscribing for more content. If you'd like to support what we make for you, check out the description for links to ways you can help us to continue bringing the past alive. To describe with truth and sufficient force those dens in cellars which are termed underground lodging houses requires the artist's brush rather than the pen. No words can convey an adequate impression of their utter wretchedness, for it is the accumulation of little details of misery which renders these sleeping places so horribly repulsive to anyone accustomed to a civilized mode of life. Imagine yourself descending through a sort of trapdoor entrance into an underground cellar, only seven or eight feet high and often less, its dingy walls and blackened ceiling dimly lit up by the filthy kerosene night lamp which the old hag, who is proprietress, holds over her head to enable you to look around. At first you can see but little, but becoming accustomed to the gloom, you find that you are standing in a perfect maze of beds. Go with me through one of these cellar lodging houses, which particularly struck me, ranged round the room, as closely packed as possible, with a narrow open space down the middle, are thirteen filthily dirty beds, all full. 
Look at the one nearest you. It contains an elderly man and a woman of at least five and twenty years of age. The old hag, who is inclined to be communicative, tells you that they are father and daughter. You shudder and pass on. In the next bed lies a fine, handsome-looking labouring man of forty. His brawny arms, stretched out at right angles, on the dirty bundle which does duty for a pillow, the head of a sleeping boy resting on each arm. Neither the father nor his boys have any other covering on them than the bedclothes. He is awake, and, in a tone of voice which implies a certain feeling of shame at being seen in such a den, he informs you that he once had a comfortable home of his own. But my wife, sir, tucked to drinking, she sold my little bits of furniture one after another, then all my clothes, with the exception of what I had on, and finally she stole my tools, and here I am. But fortunately for me, she died the thirtieth of last month. And with a sigh he added, Ha! Sir, she was a bad woman. Beyond this poor fellow are three strapping young men, all sleeping heavily, and then there is another shocking sight. A man, his wife, and their grown-up son, fast asleep in the same bed. But why continue this dreadful tale of misery and unnatural degradation? It is the same sad story all around the room, and all around the neighbourhood. Men, women, and children, many of them in a state of nudity, sleeping indiscriminately together. We visited place after place, cellar after cellar, with infatuated persistence, hoping that we might at least find some, few rather better than the rest. But it was not so, and in one of these dens human misery seemed to have reached its climax. As we entered the door of this particular cellar, a low, thin wail struck my ear. I turned quickly to the detective, saying, "'Surely that is the cry of a newborn baby.' "'Yes, sir,' said the woman who lighted us in, an unusually well-spoken Irish woman, at the same time pointing to a figure on a bed in the farther corner of the room. "'That poor woman has just been confined, not ten minutes ago.' "'Good God!' I exclaimed. "'In such a scene as this?' "'Well, sir,' she replied, "'poor folks can't afford to be as particular as Fifth Avenue.' "'And that's true, sir,' quietly observed the poor creature of whom we were speaking. We hurried away. In one of these wretched dens, a young Irish woman, who was sleeping near the entrance, suddenly sprang out of bed, and, planting herself in the doorway, made a grab at me with tiger-like ferocity, at the same time pouring out a torrent of abuse against us for coming in. Her whole demeanour showed that she was quite capable of mischief. Without taking the slightest notice of the infuriated Irish woman, my detective turned to the proprietress and quietly remarked, "'If there is the slightest disturbance, I shall report this house to the sergeant.' In an instant, the landlady and her husband were busy pacifying the angry woman, imploring her not to get them into trouble. She soon retired sullenly to bed, scowling fearfully at us during the few moments we remained. The detective's professional instinct told him that, had he attempted to pacify this fierce woman, she would in all probability have become still more violent. He knew that these lodging-house keepers are in the habit of exercising considerable influence over their lodgers. As we emerged from one of these places, our attention was arrested by the sound of many footsteps rapidly approaching, as we stepped off the pavement to allow the crowd to pass, we were shocked to see that they were carrying the apparently lifeless body of a woman. We stopped one of the crowd to ask what was the matter. Oh, only a woman poisoned herself. They're taking her to the hospital. And away our informant hurried, vexed to think that, 
by stopping to answer our inquiry, his fascinated gaze upon this poor creature of misery had been for a moment interrupted. Only a woman poisoned herself. Only a poor human being, who, tired of battling with a life of sorrow, unable any longer to make head against her sea of troubles, had thought by self-destruction to put an end to them. While thinking over this scene, a perfect mass of mud and tatters, with a baby in her arms, came up and told a piteous tale of starvation and distress, how she had once had a home of her own, how her husband had been ill for some months, how this one misfortune had been the sole cause of their present condition. The woman's eye and chattering jaw told their own sad tale. She showed no apparent signs of being a drunkard. In fact, her whole demeanour seemed to substantiate her statement. I asked her where she lodged. She replied that she lived in one of the underground cellars. Let me see your husband, I said. We followed her into a hovel, in every way similar to those we had already visited. A pitiable sight met our eyes. On one of those filthy beds lay a poor, emaciated fellow, who looked as though death would claim him in a few hours. My friend, said I to the woman, if I give you some money, will you promise me not to spend a cent of it in drink? She simply replied, I will. I took a dollar bill from my pocket and placed it in her hand. She looked at it. She stared at it. She clutched it and called out, My God! with fearful emphasis, rushed up the steps into the street without offering any thanks. Her poor husband, in weak tones, apologised for her strange behaviour, saying, We haven't seen the sight of so much money for weeks. This was certainly the most touching and heart-rending scene we witnessed in our wanderings that night. That dollar was, I feel sure, well spent. I think, sir, said the officer, you ought to see one of the swell thieves' cribs, if we can manage it. I particularly wished to do so, and we started to visit the monarch, the go-between, and patron of the light-fingered ones of the neighbourhood. My guide told me that we must exercise great caution, as we should be viewed with the utmost suspicion, and might find ourselves in hot water without a moment's warning. We descended a staircase into what was apparently a better-class oyster saloon, when a smart, well-dressed, intelligent-looking man came hurriedly forward to meet us. I was introduced to him with all the customary formalities of society. He received me with studied politeness, inquired particularly after the state of my health, and, asking us what we would take, produced a bottle and a box of the most magnificent cigars. As we were not allowed to pay for these little luxuries, I presume they cost him nothing. Seated at a round table were fourteen really well-dressed, gentlemanly-looking men. They would have passed anywhere in society, so far as regards their personal appearance. These men are among the most expert thieves in the whole country, so clever, so careful in all their little arrangements, that the police though morally certain of their character, have never yet been able to bring anything home to them. Their purloining transactions are carried on entirely through the agency of their tools. They were all talking, and talking loudly, but so peculiar was their idiom that they were quite unintelligible to me, though it occurred to me afterward that a good deal of this might have been assumed by way of blinding me as to what they were really talking about, we remained for about ten minutes, conversing with the host on various topics, and smoking his imported Havanas, when a sign from the officer, who had held a moment's whispered conversation with our entertainer, warned us that our presence was no longer desirable. We, therefore, politely wished the king of the cracksmen good evening, and had the satisfaction of hearing the click of the lock and the grating of the bolts of the door the instant we were outside. 
on gaining the pavement at the top of the staircase, the detective said to me, I guess you made him feel a kinder sick by going down there. He knows you well. I was immensely astounded and somewhat chagrined to find that this gentleman claimed a quasi-acquaintance with me. How on earth can he know me? I inquired. Oh, he's seen you coming out of one of the newspaper offices, and he makes it his business never to forget a face he has once seen. That's what he was quietly asking me about. He thinks you have visited his house for the purpose of showing him up in the papers, and he says, if you do, you are a marked man. So much for Mr. Reddy, the blacksmith. Three minutes' walk down a by-street brought us to another oyster-and-supper saloon, though this one was reputed to be of a respectable character. This is the favourite resort of those maimed soldiers who gain a subsistence, and apparently a pretty good one, by grinding organs at the corners of the streets. There were about a dozen of them present on this occasion, most of them fine, smart-looking young fellows, though I do not think there was a perfect set of limbs among the whole lot. Many were enjoying an excellent supper of beefsteak and fried potatoes, those who had only one arm being able, by a sort of juggler's action, to eat just as fast and as easily as those who had two. I am told that these men sometimes earn as much as two and a half or three dollars a day, and that they would be much disconcerted if the government should suddenly determine to take proper care of them. Some of them are said to employ an assistant to attract the contributions of charitable passers-by. The assistant receives every morning three five-cent pieces from each man. He goes round once in the morning and once in the afternoon. Dropping one of the five-cent pieces at each visit into the little wooden box on the top of the organ as ostentatiously as he can, the third piece he keeps for himself. The force of example generally leads several others to do the same, and the decoy walks unconcernedly on. This outlay of two and a half cents often brings in a quarter of a dollar, and sometimes more. Leaving the soldiers to finish their supper in peace, we entered a fighting crib. We arrived at an unfortunate moment. It was rather late in the evening, even for the pugilistic gentry, and the discussion of the arrest of Edward O. Baldwin, the Irish giant, somehow or other, was a very heated one. Why or wherefore I cannot divine, for all were agreed that it was a monstrous invasion of the rights of the private citizen. Unaware of the arrest, and knowing nothing about the giant and his prize fight, I nevertheless soon found myself drinking the giant's health and inveighing in unmeasured terms against the law, the judges, and Judge Dowling in particular. Suddenly every man let drive from the shoulder at his nearest neighbour. I have never before or since witnessed anything like it. They seem to go off like a pyrotechnical set-piece, couple of bounds over the prostrate forms of those gladiators who found that it was easy enough to go down, but not so easy to get up again, brought me to the door and to the side of the detective. Unless you want to see any more free fighting, we'd better get out of this, he said. Once them fellows begin, they'll be at it time and again, till the police comes and locks some of them up. I told him that I had quite enough of it, and that I was only too anxious to get out. Glad that I had fared no worse than to have my hat smashed. As it was now long after midnight, I determined to bring my excursion to a close. I thought that I had seen enough of the purlieus of Water Street after dark for one night, certainly enough to convince me that it is morally impossible for men to be men or women to be women, that is, in the proper sense of the word, when they dwell in Water Street.' 